Ask your crush out to the cemetery and sniff your dead daughter's dresses because we have the biggest caper to star Christian Bale since I'm Batman. Netflix's The Pale Blue Eye is a historical murder mystery that'll have you like Okay, maybe not that frustrated, but you get the gist. In this video, we'll be taking a look at the film's ending, the clues leading to the killer, and of course, its big twist. So strap on in and be sure to like and subscribe because I may not always cover the shows you're watching, but when I do... It's pretty cool. Meet investigator Augustus Landor, renowned for his work solving some of New York's most difficult crimes. He's been called to West Point Military Academy to solve a most gruesome murder, the hanging of a young cadet who's found with his heart missing. This poor guy is Cadet Leroy Fry, the first in a series of grisly murders that Landor is tasked with solving. Along the way, Landor employs the help of a young Edgar Allan Poe, yes, the famous poet. But unfortunately, since this film and the book it's based off is historical fiction, none of this really happened. There is some measure of historical accuracy as Poe did attend West Point for a brief period. But fortunately for him, he was never nearly sacrificed in a satanic ritual. Early on, we get our first suspect, Dr. Marquis, the man in charge of performing the autopsy on Mr. Fry. It's deduced that the heart was taken out by someone who was good with a knife and had a basic understanding of human anatomy. But what's more concerning were all the details the doctor missed. For example, the contusion found on the back of Mr. Fry's head or torn note clutched between his fingers. Both of these pointing to the theory that Mr. Fry did not hang himself, rather was killed. Was the doctor merely incompetent in his analysis of Mr. Fry, or is something more nefarious at play? When Landor discovers that the murder may have been the result of a satanic ritual, he visits friend and expert of the occult, Jean Pepe. There he learns of a witch hunter by the name of Henri Leclerc, who left behind instructions on achieving immortality. He would have known that at a witch's feast, they dined on unclean animals, hearts of unbaptized children, and the hearts of hanged men. Perhaps hearts were pivotal in a ritual which would give this immortality. In an effort to gain more clues, Poe infiltrates Fry's friend group which includes three men of importance, Randy Ballinger, Stoddard, and Artemis Marquis, the doctor's son. Soon he's invited over to the Marquis household where he meets Artemis' sister Leah, whom he falls in love with. But Randy isn't too fond of Poe's admiration for Leah and attacks him at night with Landor saving the day and fending off the attack. The next morning, however, Randy is found hung with his heart out, just like Cadet Fry. Poe and Landor are invited over to the Marquis home to mourn the death of Randy. There, Landor finds a few items of note, an odd-looking tome, a painting, which we'll later learn is that of witch hunter Henri Leclerc, and a West Point officer's jacket, one which is missing the bars on its shoulder. If you remember, one of the privates who was on guard the night of Fry's murder remembers being relieved by an officer who had these bars removed. With this, Landor deduces that Artemis the only Marquis family member able to wear this jacket and pull off being an officer, is likely the killer, using the killings as some sort of satanic ritual to save his ailing sister. Well, it turns out the entire family is in on it. Leah has suffered from life-threatening seizures her entire life, and she told her family that she could hear the voice of Henri Leclerc. He would tell her how to cure her and achieve immortality. Now, Dr. Marquis had tried to help his daughter his entire life, but to no avail, and thus he was willing to indulge her in these occult dealings if it would mean her getting better, and according to him, Leah started to get better. Furthermore, Leah and Artemis promised their father that Cadet Fry was already dead when they got to him, so why not take out his heart and use it for this experiment? This is why the doctor did such sloppy work on the autopsy, he was merely trying to cover up for his children. Even Mrs. Fry, played by Gillian Anderson, is in on the whole ritual too. The doctor says this experiment worked for a time, but his daughter's illness came back, hence why they needed more hearts. Unfortunately, Poe is taken as their next victim, and it's up to Landor to save the day. But the ritual goes horribly awry when the building catches on fire and Leah and Artemis are killed by a falling beam. Now you think this would be the end of the story. The murderers are killed, Dr. Marquis loses his job, and Mrs. Marquis her two children. Once again, the incomparable Augustus Landor has solved the case. That is, if it weren't for the clever ingenuity of Edgar 
Edgar Allan Poe. Earlier in the film, Poe received a letter from Landor, and he noticed something peculiar. The handwriting on it matched that of the note clutched in the hand of Cadet Fry. Surely Landor didn't have anything to do with the murders. That is, until Poe puts the pieces of the puzzle together. First, he found out about the death of Landor's daughter from Patsy, a prostitute Landor slept with and confided in. Turns out Landor's daughter, Matilda, committed suicide after she was brutally by three West Point cadets. Additionally, Poe found Fry's necklace, it may also be a dog tag, in one of Matilda's poetry books in Landor's cabin, a necklace with the initials LF for Leroy Fry. In an act of revenge, Landor wrote a fake letter to Fry posing as Patsy. In the film, it's believed that this letter was actually written by Leah, but when Fry arrives at the location, he calls out for Patsy, implying he has some sort of relationship with this prostitute. This allowed Landor to lure Fry to a secluded location, murder him, but while he was stringing him up, he's nearly discovered and has to flee. The body is later discovered and taken back to the academy where Leah and Artemis snatch out the heart. This still leaves two other men who defiled his daughter. Landor discovered that man number two was Randy Ballinger after he read Fry's journal. He killed Randy and made the body look as though it was mutilated by Satanists. The third man was Stoddard, who fled from the academy after he knew someone was killing those responsible for Matilda's rape. According to Landor, he never killed Stoddard, saying that living the rest of your life looking over your shoulder is a fate worse than death. Upon repeat viewings, you can see the director has left breadcrumbs that hint Landor is the killer. For example, the first shot of him is washing the blood off of his truncheon, Leroy Fry's blood. When he's asked to come to West Point to see the superintendent, he asks, And if I should decide not to come? he thinks he could be found out. The title of the movie is The Pale Blue Eye, which is a line from Poe's The Telltale Heart. In fact, Poe recites a line from it in the movie. In the story, the narrator describes an old man with a pale blue eye that makes the narrator go mad, resulting in him killing the old man and taking out his heart. Landor is similar to this narrator in that he too is driven by an urge to kill. This urge is driven by revenge, and just like in the story, once the deed is done, it will not relieve him of his pain. No matter what Landor does, it will not bring his daughter back. In Poe's first meeting with Landor, Poe informs him the killer must be a poet. Not an actual poet, but metaphorically someone who works with symbols. And what stronger symbol is there than the heart? The men who killed his daughter took away his heart, so to speak, his love and joy. Now, Poe has evidence that could put Landor away for good, but instead of turning him in, he burns it. Perhaps he knows that Landor won't kill again, that the suffering he's faced so far is prison enough as is. The last shot is of Landor on the same cliff his daughter committed suicide. He lets go of his daughter's cloth, a metaphor for letting go and coming to terms with her loss. It's left ambiguous whether or not he jumps off to join her, but I tend to believe he didn't. As director Scott Cooper tells Netflix, I think Landor has finally come to terms with the loss of his daughter, and I think he's mimicking in her footsteps, but I think he ultimately realizes is there's more to life. But what did you think? Did Landor plummet to his death to join his daughter, or did he finally let go? I want to hear your thoughts and theories in the comments below. Thanks for watching, everyone. Be sure to like and subscribe, and for more bad takes, you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at ThinkStoryYT. Until next time, remember, I'm Batman.